people with synesthesia experience the ordinary world in quite extraordinary ways. For some people, as they're listening to my words now, each word is its own distinct colour, perhaps projected in their mind's eye or floating like a ticker tape in space. For other people, when they listen to music, it's not just an auditory experience, it's an animated visual spectacle of dancing shapes, colours and textures. For some people, such as Carol Steen in this picture, when she has acupuncture or feels touch or pain in her body, she experiences dynamic floating commas, in this case bright red, against a deep velvety background. So synesthesia seems very extraordinary to us, but to people with synesthesia, that is the only reality they know. This is how they experience the world, and for them, this is a perfectly normal uh, way of experiencing things. It isn't just about vision. In this example, this is James Wanerton's depiction of the London Underground. So for him, every word that he hears, thinks about, or reads is like an ebb and flow of flavours and tastes that are subjectively appearing on his tongue. So some train stations might taste like apple pie or celery uh, and so on. And to him, this is how he experiences things since childhood. For other people, they may have auditory experiences. Can we have this movie, please? I don't know whether people can hear this. Well, this is a silent movie, so you shouldn't be hearing it. But for some people with synesthesia, this creates a whooshing, shooshing sound, for instance, or a change in pitch, very dynamic. So for these people, everyday life is very noisy, whether or not they're literally hearing something or not. So more formally, we can think of synesthesia as kind of joining of the senses in which they experience something extra tagged onto that which most people do. So in this case, they're having an extra auditory experience on top of a more typical visual experience. Synesthesia turns out to be quite common. You will all know somebody with synesthesia, but you probably don't know who it is unless you've asked them what colour is this piece of music. Synesthesia is a real biological condition. It runs in families, although the particular associations don't necessarily. So, for instance, um, somebody who experiences synesthetic taste may have family members who experience synesthetic colour. So it's a general disposition here. And we know that there is a genetic basis to synesthesia uh, through studies of the, the genome, although we don't fully understand what these genes are doing. They're almost certainly affecting the way that the brain matures, because synesthetes have differences in their brain both in terms of grey matter, they've got more grey matter density in, say, parts of the brain to do with seeing. So parts of the brain seeing colour, they have more of this. And similarly, with regards to connectivity, they have more white matter connectivity between different regions of the brain. So they might, for instance, connect the auditory parts of the brain with the visual parts of the brain in a way that other people don't normally. And I say don't normally, but there's one claim in that we all had synesthesia at one point of our life, and that's when we looked like this, when we were infants. So one suggestion is that we're all born with synesthesia, and most people lose it as part of the normal maturation process, but synesthetes, due to their different genetic composition, retain these roots that link together the senses. And we may not all fully lose synesthesia entirely. We're all able to link our senses together. And synesthesia reveals the rules by which we can understand uh, the links between vision and music. And this has important implications for arts, for instance. So nobody knows whether Kandinsky was a synesthete or not. Some people say he is, some people say he wasn't. But he knew about synesthesia. Synesthesia was well documented at the time he was producing his artwork. And what Kandinsky wanted is that people should understand his artwork not solely through the visual medium, but they should understand it more as a multi-sensory kind of gestalt that encompass all the different senses. So I'm just going to do a little test now, and I'm just going to play two different sounds, and I want you to think about which sound goes with this Kandinsky painting. Kandinsky didn't do this experiment, by the way, this is just me. So if you can listen to sound one, please. And sound two. There's no right or wrong answer here. Most people tend to go with sound one here that's more discordant, uh, whereas sound two is more harmonious. So again, this might sound trivial, but actually, why is that? What are these particular rules? And it turns out that there's a whole set of rules for linking vision and music together. And we can analyse this by looking at the experiences of synesthetes. And a lot of them are present from the, uh, the earliest ages in infants too. So we know that they're not purely cultural. If anything, the way that our senses interact might be influencing our culture rather than vice versa. 
So for instance, if you're a synesthete listening to a high pitch sound relative to a low pitch sound, a high pitch sound is going to be brighter, it's going to be smaller, it's going to be higher up in space, and it's going to be more jaggedy, for instance. And most synesthetes tend to have these principles, although they might differ in exactly how it's experienced. So we've done various experiments with these particular kinds of stimuli. So one of the things that we've done is that we've taken these uh, descriptions of how synesthetes see the world and we've tweaked them in some way. So for instance, we can simply just rotate it left to right or flip it top to bottom. We can change the color. So if a synesthete experiences a yellow disc doing this, we can flip that color to say red or green or brown or something like this. And what we can then do is play the pair of movies to people and ask them which image, which movie goes best with the sound. And what you find is that people who don't have synesthesia, they choose the synesthetic uh, original movie uh, as being the best representation or as being the most aesthetically pleasing um, one that goes with it. So people who don't have synesthesia can tune into these properties that synesthetes naturally experience within their mind's eye. We've also got people who don't have synesthesia to try and draw for the animator their own experience, well, not their own experiences, what it might be like to experience synesthesia. And again, if we show those experiences with a true synesthete, people prefer the true synesthete's uh, experience here relative to the one that somebody's tried to recreate. So the synesthete probably has a richer, more vivid kind of vocabulary for matching this, but other people use the same rules as well. What does that mean for creativity and art? Are synesthetes more creative? Well, we've done formal measures of creativity and showed that there does seem to be some trends for synesthetes to score better on some tests. What is perhaps more striking is that if we look at the occupations of synesthetes or their hobbies, we find that they tend to gravitate more towards the arts. So these unusual experiences are probably very beautiful for them and um, it probably inspires them to create art. But it might also affect their brain in ways that actually is helpful. So we know that synesthetes are better at distinguishing between different colours that to most people look very similar. They can tell them apart much better. So that would be a raw ability that would help in the world of art. This is one of the artists I've worked with who lives near me in Brighton. She's a portrait artist, but rather than painting people's faces, she paints people's voices. So this is from a CD, but she sometimes does interviews with people and paints their voices as she's having a conversation with them. So this is a very novel concept that's inspired by her unique experience. So that's visual experiences. What about touch or pain? So when I was a lecturer at UCL, I sent an email out saying, here's this thing called synesthesia. Does anybody think that they have this? And I got a reply back saying, well, I don't know whether this is synesthesia, but whenever I see somebody being touched, I feel touch on my own body. So what she reports when looking at this movie on the left is that when seeing a, a finger going up and down somebody's face, such as this, she would say, I feel a, a tactile sensation on my right cheek, as if you're looking in a mirror of that particular person. They tend not to report tactile experiences when looking at objects touched, although there's some variability in that. And what we find is that when we look in the brains of people who are watching this kind of image here, seeing other people being touched, um, that this is not just activating the visual parts of the brain. So this is a purely visual stimulus, but the brain does not interpret it solely in visual ways. And this happens both whether you have synesthesia or whether you don't. So you activate parts of the brain that are involved in uh, perceiving touch or pain. So it's almost as if you are kind of embodying what that other person is feeling. But for a synesthete, you experience that consciously. And for other people, it's more an implicit um, embodiment. Um, synesthetes also use some of these same mechanisms, but they use it in a somewhat different way, drawing on different brain regions that probably enable them to experience this consciously. What does this mean for art and for other kinds of constructs, such as empathy? What it means is that um, mapping between the visual sense and the bodily senses is something we do naturally, and it may enable us, for instance, in this image, to empathize with uh, people in pain uh, and, and so on. But this could also be an artistic device. So artists, uh, when they're depicting uh, figures and pain and so on, they might not understand that this is how the brain works, but they're wanting people to actually be affected viscerally, to kind of empathize with what they see. And this is the actual underlying mechanism of this. 
in collaboration with uh, Daria Martin, we've also looked at how these people with what we call mirror touch synesthesia respond to artworks. This is uh, a Giacometti sculpture. Giacometti produced these distorted uh, bodily images. And this is what one of our participants says. I love to stand in front of the Giacometti, and it's a very good feeling. So I love to stand in front of them and feel I am getting longer. So what the, this person is reporting is that their own body feels like it's being stretched or distorted in uh, some curious way. So this image here isn't depicting uh, touch or pain, it's just an unusual body. But nevertheless, what these people have is a tendency for vision to kind of override their own internal bodily senses in a way they become what it is that they're seeing, in a way that is really kind of interesting and profound. So what does this all mean with regards to the relationship between art and science? For me, I think one of the uh, most profound things that synesthesia tells us is that there really are multiple ways of experiencing the world. And people have debated this, obviously, for a long time, and lots of other people have drawn that conclusion. But science can give us a real kind of handle on that and say, actually, there are differences in the brain. We can chase, chase this all the way back to genes and do the link right from genes to unusual conscious experiences. But also that these different ways of experiencing the world matter. They're not just epiphenomenal. Synesthetes perform differently on various measures. So um, seeing colors they're good at, they're better at memory, for instance. They gravitate towards the arts. These are real differences that, that affect uh, society. And uh, synesthetes aren't vanishingly rare. There are a few percent of the population, we would say. I think the other thing that we get from synesthesia that uh, tells us about the arts is that it kind of tells us the, the rule book for how the different senses play out and relate to each other. And this can be used in various artistic ways. So for instance, you can figure out what the best sound is that goes with the color red. And you can use this, for instance, in, in art installations. One of the ways we're using this is to work with people who are blind and have auditory depictions of the visual world. So what we'd want to do is kind of sonify the, the, this image that I'm seeing now so that they can uh, understand what colors out there, the different spatial relationships between objects. And that's not a trivial problem. How do you convert something from vision into sound? But synesthesia gives you a handle on how you might go about doing that and have some real world implications. So for me, synesthesia is an absolutely fascinating biological entity, but it really tells us something about the human experience. Thank you for your time.